happy Monday. How are you guys? Um, I'll give you guys a second to get on. So today is Monday with Melodies, something new we're trying over here. And I wanted to just chat with you today about working with a manufacturer. So give you guys just a second when you come on, say, hey, hope you guys had a good weekend. I had an out of town guest this weekend. It was so fun. Anyways, so let's get started in today. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about working with manufacturers because I always say that when you select your manufacturer, it's almost like selecting your marriage partner. They are really, really a huge part of your business because they supply your product. So I never want to assume that you guys understand, you know, what I'm talking about in general. So I'll start high level. There's a couple different types of manufacturers you can work with. There's private label where you literally just take a product line, um, stick your label on it and you're out. Sometimes that's called white label, sometimes it's called off the shelf, but private label is basically what it means. Those products are tested, they're readily available. Usually you can't make a lot of changes with the, the packaging. Sometimes you can maybe switch out, you know, a, a bottle type or something, but generally it's all pretty set. And um, obviously private label is the fastest way to market. It gives you the most flexibility and those sorts of things. Um, the other type of, of manufacturing is custom or contract manufacturing. So custom or contract manufacturing is where you work with the lab directly and they create a formula for you that's exclusive for your brand. Now, this can be done a couple different ways. You can take one of their private label bases and like tweak it to work with your formula, or you can come to them with a wish list of ingredients and, and add kind of what you're looking for. Um, that's another way of doing it with a, a contract manufacturer. The other thing that you can do is just kind of give them like benchmarks or some brand examples. We do this quite a bit in our industry. I'll, I'll go pick up like, hey, we love this product. Can we, can we create something similar to or better? right? That happens quite a bit. And then the third way is if you're making your product at home and you're outsourcing your manufacturing. So there's no real uh, R&D involved other than tweaking what you have to work with their equipment and they just go to manufacturing with your product. So that's high level of working the three different ways you're actually going to create a product with the lab. But let's talk about how you actually select the, the lab that you're going to work with, okay? So if you're going to, most people, when they, they start looking for a product line or a lab to work with, they look for people in their area. And that's fine, except for oftentimes you have to look for people that specialize in what you do. Usually in manufacturing, um, if you guys have all seen a KitchenAid, right? Manufacturers, they have, they have KitchenAids basically, but in like 10 gallons, 20 gallons, 30 gallons. So you'll want to find someone that, that has the equipment and the knowledge of doing a product line of what you want versus in your location. So that's tip number one. Make sure that you find someone that specializes in exactly what you want to create. And there's generally not a lot of crossovers. So if they're an amazing hair, you know, hair manufacturer, they're an amazing hair manufacturer. If they are an amazing skincare manufacturer, they're, that's just what they do. If they do color cosmetics, again, that's their specialty. And you really want to work with someone with their specialty. Um, and that can go in the other direction of like, if you're all about natural and organics and you've find a lab, but they don't really believe in natural and organics. And that's a big part of it. In my opinion, they have to believe in it because, you know, a chemist, some cosmetic chemists will argue that, you know, there is no definition of natural, which is true. And parabens and small dosages are fine. So you've got to find someone that has that same philosophy that you're looking for as well. And then the third component is you've got to have someone that can hit your minimums. You, I'm sure you guys have all learned this as you're calling around looking for labs. They've got like 3000 minimums or 5000 minimums and like super high and almost to the point where it takes it out of your area. So um, those are kind of three criteria that you look for when you're looking for a lab. Look for someone that specializes in what you do. If you're doing a natural hair care line, make sure that they're the best at it. If you're doing makeup, make sure you do a color cosmetic lab. It's very, it's rare that you'll find a really strong makeup manufacturer that also does skincare. And I've never seen one that does skincare and hair care. Um, the other thing is look for someone that um, is, you know, fits your philosophy of what you need. So if you're all natural and organic, they need to be all natural and organic, or at least not afraid of it. And then the third one is make sure that um, you guys can actually build a relationship. So this is an important part. And this is kind of what started this idea for this Facebook Live is a relationship with your lab. So I have a lot of, of my private clients, they will call me and say, hey, I'm working with so-and-so lab and you know what? They're not returning my phone calls. They, the samples, it's been a year or 10 months. I haven't received a sample back. I had one client, she went and visited a lab. She came back crying. It was such a poor experience. So 
when I started this Facebook Live, I said your manufacturer is like your marriage partner because you're your business partner. So that relationship is so, so crucial. Now I want to just kind of guide you on how you can make that relationship spectacular. Okay. So this is a technique that I say a lot to people. It's called kindly persistence. So you know how much work it takes to build your one product line, right? You're building your brand, you're making all these decisions, logos, fonts, those kind of things. Imagine if you're the manufacturer and you've got a hundred product lines that you're that you're representing, that you're manufacturing, they have a lot of decisions. So obviously they have to prioritize who they interact with and when. That's just how it happens. Eventually they'll hire more staff, but initially it, it is all about you know who you prioritize with and when. And so when you are a new lab or a new brand, it's your job to build that relationship with the lab. So I call that being kindly persistent. That you know, after that initial phone call conversation that you have a note every Monday, I'm going to follow up with them. They love your project. They want to work on your project, but oftentimes they're really, really overwhelmed. So until you can get them into a rhythm and start really getting a regular response, um, it's kind of your responsibility to build that relationship. And the relationship, once it's built, and once you guys have a good, good relationship, it's amazing because let's say, you know, your line takes off and all of a sudden you've just had like, this huge increase and you went from, you know, maybe buying 500 units to 10,000 units and you need them out in like three or four weeks. When you've built that really healthy, good relationship with your rep, it's easy for them to want to accommodate you. And of course, maybe they can't make that 10,000 units right away, but they can maybe get you out a thousand of them and then keep rolling them out. So those relationships will sustain your business long term. So make sure that when you're looking for someone, uh, a lab, that you choose someone that you can work with long term because it really, really, really is a marriage and a relationship. I know I have many of my clients, you know, are now my friends. And it starts because we spend a lot of time together building their lines. So I just wanted to leave you those points. Um, looks like we had a few people join us. Hey Sharon, thanks for saying hey. I wanted to, and I forgive me for looking at my phone. I gotta pull up these questions that Kaylise um asked. She asked about working with uh, natural hair care. So natural hair care is huge. The thing about natural hair care is you really got to go to someone that is specializes in natural hair care. Like if you go to someone that they don't really do ethnic hair care, particularly natural hair, they don't really understand how to do it. Um, on my website, there is a vendor guide of my trusted vendors. You can go download that and I'll post that in the comments. Um, there's just two really high level that I love, um, Seed, and that's M-S-E-E-D, and then IRA Cosmetics. I think they are one of the best for natural hair care in our space, with meaning our space, meaning independent indie beauty brands that are just starting, still buying small quantities. I think they do a fantastic job. So I hope that helps. Um, and I, you, your name says Kay Elise. I don't know what you like to go by, but for right now, that's what I'll call you. I know I'm going to get to see you in Atlanta, so that'll be fun. Let me see if we had any other questions that were there. And if you guys are joining, you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, okay, Kaylee's asks, when going to the private label route, would you recommend a one-stop shop, labels, packaging, or buying in bulk? So that's a really good question. Let me answer that. So when do you buy in bulk? You buy in bulk when you're gonna fill yourself or you have a filling company. So maybe the manufacturer you're working with doesn't actually fill tubes. Tubes, while well, we see them common on the marketplace in the industry, you see these little seals, you gotta have like a really um, special machine to actually, it holds on the bottom, the tubes open and it fills that way. You've gotta have a special machine to actually fill that. And usually the minimums are 5,000 units to get started on something like that. So um, you really, really wanna make sure that you are you know, filling a product um, with a lab that can do it. Now, if your lab, you love the product, but they can't fill it, then you would find a film fill company. And so if that's the case, then um, that's when you would buy bulk. Now, some of you are filling your products at home or using bases and changing them at home. So those are the candidates that would buy bulk. I personally, as you guys will follow along long enough, will know that I am not a big fan of actually buying bulk and filling products. I firmly believe that we as beauty brand owners our only job is marketing and sales. I really don't think that we should be making product unless you plan to set up your own warehouse and manufacturing. And some of you guys go that route just to keep costs down and it's part of your brand story. And that's fine. But eventually at some point you need to have a plan to outsource that. So that's my thing. I prefer that if you work with a manufacturer that they 
fill it, mix it, label it, bottle it, and send it to your distribution or your home or wherever that's going to be, and that you work on your marketing and sales. That's just kind of my philosophy on that. Um, Kaylee says, what's the best marketing strategy for a new product line? You know what, honey, I'm going to cover that in our Atlanta event, so we'll talk about that there. If you guys haven't signed up for the Atlanta event, um, I was told we have 15 spots today that are sold, so if you guys want to come, I think we have, the room can hold 20 total. That'd be great. Um, hi, Eli. He asked me, can I re repeat those two brands? So the manufacturer, Eli, for you guys would be MSeed or IRA Cosmetics. I'm going to put that in the comments. MC is a sister scientist, and she's super cool if you guys follow her at all. And then um, I jacked up my computer screen. But anyways, um, and then I, I are you with, um, her name is Emily. I really like her. I think they specialize in the best. Now, um, Eli, with your product, with your product, though, yours is a little different. With your product, you just want someone that can do a hot fill. And that's your biggest criteria. And so, and of course, every brand is unique, you guys. That's why I, like, I, I never am like, oh, it's a cookie cutter. Yes, the, the concepts are the same, but there's so many nuances to building a brand. So, Eli, um, look at this company. It's called, I think it's called North Coast. No, I'm sorry. It's North Coast Organics. They're a little, they're a deodorant company out in uh, Indiana. But the thing I like about them is that um, they do hot fills, and they do hot fills all day long. So that's what I like about them. All right, I'm trying to keep up. You guys have a lot of questions. Please type them in. Hey, Angela. Um, okay. I'm going to butcher your name, but we're going to get a chance to chat about this. How do I say your name? And, and I know it's Itashia. Um, and I'm sorry. I, I know you've told me so many times. Um, she asked, what are the rules or guidelines for creating custom makeup products as far as quantity for the first time? For example, do they create a client that wants to start one product? And if so, how much should I expect to pay for custom create a product or makeup line? Example, lipstick or lip gloss. So that's a good question. So the big, the big manufacturers, the so traditional manufacturers, and you guys know I work with a lot of kind of um, manufacturers that most people just don't, you can't Google and find. Um, but the traditional manufacturers, when you're creating like a custom lip color or uh, makeup line, your minimums are about 1,500 SKUs. I will post a lab for you specifically that I want to work with in the inner circle so you can see it. I'll tag you in it. But there are manufacturers out there that will do smaller amounts on lip colors, um, maybe 150, 500 units. The, the per like product price generally is $5 on it. That's kind of um, just a general. Again, there's nuances to what goes in the product and your packaging and all those kind of things, but that's kind of the average on lips. Sometimes you can get like off the shelf private label lip colors like three to $4, but custom depending on quantity and packaging is usually around five. Sometimes it's lower. Um, usually when you customize products, like your price is lower than private label, but um, if you work with a traditional lab, you have to buy 500, 1,000, you know, 3,000 units, so your costs are going to be lower. But if you're going to buy 50 units, then those things go lower as well. All right. So let's see. I see any other comments. Eli says we're looking for packaging as well. Are you guys changing your packaging, Eli? Um, I think you're in glass still, right? Let me know if you're still in glass. If you're still in glass, I would recommend um, ABBA packaging. That's ABBA packaging, but I'm not sure. Sharon says she's finding custom manufacturing minimums, 10,000 units per shade. Sharon, what type of product are you manufacturing? You can post that for me. I'd love to help you with that. Um, Heather, hi Heather. I always see your bright colored hair all over the internet and I love it. Um, do you recommend working with a manufacturer in your city to cut down shipping costs? I'm in LA. So I don't generally recommend working with a manufacturer in your city. I often, I just started this out, I recommend working with a manufacturer that specializes in what you try to do. Now there's a caveat to that. The manufacturing hubs are LA, Dallas, New Jersey, a little bit in Austin. There's like two or three labs in Austin. There's a couple sprinkled in Oregon, and there's some manufacturing in Idaho. But because you are in a hub, a manufacturing hub, Heather, you can definitely look for labs in LA. But again, remember the criteria is first that um, they do what you want them to do, and then second that you know it works for you. Location is secondary. So if there's something particular you need. Um, don't limit yourself just to the LA market. Again, your labs are going to be um, LA, Dallas, New Jersey, Austin a little bit, Chicago, Oregon a little bit, generally. Um, all right. 
Okay, nor okay, so Itachiaya. Sorry, honey. I know I'm I'll practice, I promise. Because <laughs> I know we're gonna work together soon. Especially organic and natural lipstick. I will uh send you a message in the inner circle about that. So there you go. Um Okay, Sharon says she's looking for blush, bronzers, eyeshadows, contour powder, highlighter, what I've quoted in UK and some companies as I've contacted in the US. Okay, are you in the UK or are you in the US? And is the criteria vegan or natural or are, is there any criteria just high performance? So all of those things matter. Like Sharon's like, okay, I'm looking for all of these products in the makeup category. I'm finding 10,000. And my question's back to her, what are your brand's criteria? Because that's also another component when you're looking for a manufacturer. So I'm going to assume that your standard is at least a clean ingredient deck. Some of the labs that you may want to consider, consider is like Contemporary Cosmetic or Columbia Cosmetics. They, they might be a good option for you with some of their products. Um, any other questions? I love this conversation. Clearly you guys needed this. So if you like this conversation, you're in Atlanta, I will be in Atlanta on Sunday. I'm super excited. Other than the fact that it looks like it's 64 degrees, which it's 90 here. So I, just, I don't even know how to dress. I, I mostly um, wear flip flops. So <laughs> it'll be interesting to see. Um, yeah. So um, if you're in Atlanta, come. We'll work through all of these things. It is an entire class that we kind of work through individually to help you get to your get your product out. If you already have a product, we're going to be talking about marketing because marketing is just as equally as important as product creation. Um, I spend a lot of my time on both subjects because it's super important. So I'll post the Atlanta link below. If you're not in Atlanta, I will be in Dallas for the Indie Beauty Show. I'm going to be um, hosting some private VIP clients and then doing a meetup and walking the show with some clients as well. So I'd love to see you guys there. And the other way to work with me is we're going to be starting the next round of Beauty Brand Bootcamp. That will be starting. You'll see emails coming out about it soon. So in the next week or so. So if you can't actually physically come to Atlanta or come to um, Dallas, we can do the class online, so it'll we'll find a way to work together. But keep going what you're doing. If you find a no, just keep looking or keep asking questions because there's someone out there that can help you with your manufacturing. Um, there are a lot of small manufacturers. As I say, manufacturers are not good marketers, which is great. They're busy, which is another great thing, which is your job to build that relationship to make sure that you stay in front of their minds, that you don't get offended, that they didn't call you back, that you're just kindly persistent with them. Um, and that is just the industry, and it's okay. They they don't need the business, which is awkward but true. Okay. Um, Heather says, do you recommend going around to different manufacturers and basically interviewing them um, before choosing who, who to work with, planning to start with lipsticks? Okay. So this is a good question, Heather. I'm so glad you asked that. First of all, th there's very few labs that will let you actually tour their facility. Obviously, they have non-disclosures and FDA requirements that won't allow you back there. Some of them do have like showrooms so you can go visit. That would be great. But if they say, no, you can't come, don't get offended. It's just proprietary information or they'll meet you um, out. So just if somebody says, no, we can't, don't cross them off immediately. It's just how they run their business. Um, do I recommend interviewing? Yes, absolutely. I hate to say that our vibes matter, but vibes, vibes and cost of goods matter. So if you get a funny vibe from the beginning, there's a good chance it's a funny vibe the whole way through. So, um, but also you can get an amazing vibe, but the cost of goods are ridiculous. That's a sign too. So you've got to make sure that it matches. Okay. There is definitely a range when you're looking at um, skincare and cosmetic and hair care. And this is something I teach in the beauty brand, beauty brand boot camp is that, you know, marketplace sets the value. So although your man, lab may quote you $11 for your lipstick cost, if you can't sell it for, you know, times four, which you probably won't at 40 some dollars, um, they're just not a good fit. So even if you love them, the numbers have to make sense more importantly than the vibes. So, um, why I, I love good vibes, I go off of energy quite a bit personally, M you know, money matters. So they've got to make sense. Um, so reverse engineer what your, you know, marketplace is selling the products for. So you can go into your meetings with labs, kind of understanding what those costs of goods are. So that's going to be super duper important as well. Okay. Um, any other questions? And Heather, I'm glad. I'm so happy for you. Let us know how it goes that you've already researched and setting them up. You know, so let me talk to you guys real quick about timelines and I'll let you go. First of all, a private label should take four to six weeks if you're assuming you have your artwork created and those sorts of things. Custom manufacturing should take 
realistically, I'm going to say six to nine months. I used to say six, three to six months, but I'm not finding that labs are getting projects out that fast. And it really, it, it goes actually back to the customers that the customers just aren't really clear on what they want. So right now I'm seeing six to nine months on custom products. That's assuming we're not talking about like an OTC sunscreen or, or an eczema type product that we're talking about cosmetic claims only. So I hope that helps. Um, okay, this is a really good question. So what if we don't, what if we don't like the final product? What can we do to prevent that from happening as much as possible? So here's what's going to happen. Okay. And I wish you guys could see my office. Maybe one day I'll host an event at my office. You guys can see it. So what, what they're going to do is send you these really cute little jars, right? I'm, I'm going with, this is a, this is a skincare, a hair care product, actually a butter we're doing for our hair. So I do product development quite a bit. Um, what they're going to do is send you these jars and these are going to be their lab samples that's going to be filled with product and they're going to send it to you and you get to test it. So you test it, you sit with it, you go back and forth with it for a long time. When you test it, that's you will sign off then on um, that formula. So there's no going to manufacturing you don't like it. If you go to manufacturing and it, you don't like it, it's because it's separated, but you can't change your scent once you approve that final formula. You can't make those kind of changes. So they're gonna send you lab batches for your approval. Once you approve that, then you can go on to manufacturing. So I hope that helps. Um, I've, ne I've literally never seen anybody go to production and like or approve a formula, go to production, and then not take the formula. It's just not happened because that approval helps that. Um, Okay, so um, Kaylee, uh, and this is something I'll teach in the Atlanta workshop, but yeah, minimum cost of goods is uh, four, four times four. Sometimes it's more if you're going to actually do drop shipping because you'll need that 30% margin in there for the distributors. So minimum, your, your, so you could take your retail price point and divide it by four, and that should be your cost of goods. Now, there's exceptions to the rule. Skincare obviously always has a better margin in it. Um, except for cleansers, but there's exceptions to the rules for sure. But usually it's, you know, divided by four. That's why I cringe when my daughter wants to go buy Fenty makeup. I'm like, really? <laughs> it just makes you cringe. Other than I get, I get it. Um, so yeah, so I hope that helps. Um, but sometimes the margins are better. I mean, it just depends on the formula. It really does. But as a general rule for, you know, divided by four should be your cost of goods. And so in that has got to include your packaging as well. So um, something to keep in mind, like if you do, and I should have had more packaging around me. I have these. I have, this is an example. This is a great example. All right. These are two brands um, that I'm working with right now. And so same size, literally same size. Um, the plastic jar, the difference is the, the cap. So this is a, a shiny metal gold, and this is a black plastic cap, right? Literally the same shape, same size, everything else. The difference is about a dollar. So this product costs about a dollar more than this product because of the packaging. So when we talk about your final cost of goods, that's got to include your packaging as well. And so if you want the fancy packaging, just remember that you've got to include that in your final cost of goods as well. And labels too. I had someone in the inner circle shoot me a message saying they're about to pay $1.90 for a label. I almost choked. Like you have to like include that into your pricing and I've never seen that high of, of, of label pricing. So, you know, be mindful of that. Um, okay. What do you recommend to go to learn about formulating products for makeup? So, you, you know, that's a good conversation. And I, you know, there's a lot of great resources. So Perry's got a great resource at Chemist Corner. There's Formula Botanica, those sorts of things. You can, you can become your own formulating chemist. I do hundreds of products a year. I am not a chemist. Matter of fact, I got kicked out of chemistry class at college. I went to Howard. They used to have those magnesium strips. They're like, don't, whatever you do, don't drop this in fire. What do I do? I drop it in fire. Boom, blows up third floor at the Howard building. Yeah, that was me. Anyway, so um, I don't have a chemistry background. I understand product development. Those are different. You don't really need a chemistry background to be able to talk to the lab. Like their job is to make sure that you can create. Most brand owners do not have chemistry backgrounds. They are not formulators. That they have a vision for a brand. They maybe use a product. They're really good marketers. Your real skill that you need to learn is marketing. That's all I can say. Um, 
all day long is you've got to learn marketing. It's much more complicated than product development. And so um, what will happen to entrepreneurs, and we'll spend six months, nine months, a year, maybe five years prior to that, visualizing it and dreaming about our product line. We finally get there. We create our product line, but we have no clue how to sell it. And so that's one of those things that I spend a tremendous amount of time educating my inner circle and my clients on is about marketing because, you know, the product development side, I don't want to say is the easy part because you guys are all in it. It probably doesn't feel easy, but once you get through it, you're going to be like, wow, that really was the easy part. Let me switch over, you know, um, to marketing it. And by that time, it's almost too late. So it's not too late. You just got to catch up. So um, I really, you know, as much as I would love for you guys to have the chemistry background, you really don't need it. You really just need to understand marketing and, and you'll be wild success. Most of the brands that I know that are really successful, they're, they're good marketers. Um, they may even make their product at home, but they don't have it. So Formula Botanica and Perry's group with Chemist Corner has a good group too. Hi, Lamar. Um, well, Lamar says, so true, you have to sell it. Otherwise, you just have a bunch of amazing products in your garage. Right. I still have water bottles from college in my garage. I had the, this business called the Water Bottle Store. At that time, I was a really good digital marketer because you'd throw up a website and people would come. But, um, you know, once it got a little bit more competitive and my ad spend was too high, I stopped selling them. So if you guys ever want a water bottle, maybe I'll do a giveaway. I don't know. Pretty, pretty sad. But anyway, so that's where we spend our time is marketing. So Heather, I'm so glad you enjoyed that. Please, please reach out if you guys need some help. There's a couple of different ways we can work together. I do have the inner circle as well, which is something that I spend so much time on marketing. We just had Marla come and talk about PR because in the beauty industry, press is another area that you really need to have in your business. And although we all say we don't have enough money and those kind of things, um, you do, you have to have that. So the inner circle is kind of like my lab for my beauty brands where we talk about all the things and learn all the skills we need to actually create a product line. So anyways, um, Kaylee's, Kaylee says, should we hire for marketing? So if that's an interesting question, I, um, I have a couple different thoughts about it. So here's my first thought is one, you should always understand at least the whole process of marketing. Like I, like I'm going to Lamar's class not because I need to learn more, but he stays on top of what the marketing trends are. I need to understand the marketing. Will I outsource that? Yes, I'm outsourcing my marketing. But I at least want to understand my language behind it so I can communicate with the person that's running my ads or the person that's handling my Instagram so I understand like what they actually are doing, right? So I understand the ROI, so I understand the whole process of it. Um, I think there's some skills that are worth investing in or outsourcing is copywriting right? And then learning ads, basically. Those are the two things that I think you have to learn. So um, I know Lamar's event is full. He did a class below. Uh, you can go look for it, Kaylee's, on um, marketing. A few, maybe that was November. I don't even know. I'll, I'll tag you in it so you can see it. But I definitely think that um, understanding marketing and outsourcing is a good way to go. There's people in here that are doing really high volume monthly sales and they do all their own mark in house marketing. So it just depends on your time and you know what your propensity is to wanting to learn it basically. So good questions. Anybody else? I'm happy to hang out with you guys as long as we got some time on it. All right. So you guys got asked, asked some awesome questions. I will be asking you in an email what you want to learn about next. I did ask that question a while ago, so we'll continue with our Mondays with Melodies. And if you have any questions after this, you're catching the replay, post it below, tag me in, and I'll come back in tonight and answer them for you. All right, guys, we'll see you later. Bye-bye.